shines for all to see. Your name, your name is victory. All praise you provide to Christ our King. Your name, is ready. 
It is finished. He has defeated sin and death both. Jesus Christ is greater than these two, greater than our greatest enemies, our own sin and brokenness and the death that is the consequence of that sin. We've been talking about Jesus being greater than all things for several weeks now. He's greater than the most magnificent of angels. Throughout history, angels have appeared to mankind at different times. The, the response is almost always the same. Human beings in the presence of angels are filled with terror and fear, and the angels have to put our minds at ease. Fear not. The Bible tells us that Jesus is also greater than the most powerful prophets who have ever spoken on God's behalf. But not only that, he's, he's greater than the most faithful of priests who have ever served any of us. Who have spoken on our behalf before a holy God. He's far greater than any of them. And today we turn the page as we continue our series in the book of Hebrews. Looking at chapters 9 and 10, today we recognize that Jesus is greater even than the sacrifices, the countless sacrifices that had been commanded by God himself to maintain the relationship that he desired with his people. For centuries, his people had sacrificed hundreds of thousands of lambs and bulls and goats to cover their sin, to maintain an acceptable relationship with their Heavenly Father. And the author of Hebrews has the audacity to say that Jesus is greater even than those sacrifices that open the door of relationship between the creation and the Creator. How is Jesus greater than the sacrifices? <clears throat> a few weeks ago, uh, my son Grant and I took a little road trip. He was on spring break, and uh, everybody else was either back in school or had to work, and so he and I hopped in the car on a Sunday afternoon after church, and we headed for Nashville, Tennessee. We just spent just a couple days hanging out together with some friends there, and, and the two of us just kind of bumping around. And, but one afternoon, Grant decided he wanted to go shopping, and so we drove back into Nashville to stop at a, a couple shoe stores. Now, Grant is a shoe guy. He loves shoes. He's got dozens of shoes. Every season rolls around. We've got to have new shoes, right? He loves shoes. I don't know if you're up on the shoe game or not, but, but the shoe market has gone mad over the past several years. You see, shoe manufacturers, they... They make lots and lots of shoes that you see in stores all the time. But they figured out several years ago, if they take those shoes that we all love and buy up, and they, they change the colors on them slightly, and they only manufacture maybe a few hundred pairs, those then become collector items. They, they can, they can re-market Jordans that we used to wear in the 90s. They can put out new color patterns on those and sell them for five to ten times what we used to pay. It's insane. We went into the first shoe store, and we were looking around. We walk in, and the back wall has all the shoes on display. There were about 30 pairs of shoes there. I'm like, not much selection. You have to sell these things all the time in order to to keep the shop open. I saw a, a shoe there that I, I kind of liked. I was like, that's a good looking shoe. Let me see. Pulled it off the shelf. Just over $1,100. That looked great right where it was. $1,100. And then the one after that was 800 And after that, 700, another 800. Oh, the whole wall. I'm like, oh, you only got to sell like one pair of shoes a day. A couple of weeks, you're good to go. We left that shop and went to another one. Same thing. Walls filled with shoes worth hundreds and hundreds of dollars. And people were buying them while we were there. Grant got a pair of socks. <laughs> Cost me 500 bucks. No. Just 
You know, because shoe prices have gone through the roof, there have been people who have thought to themselves, I wonder if I could make a counterfeit that looks close enough to like the real thing that I can, I can kind of maybe make a, little, a living on the side. And sure enough, the shoe market, the counterfeit shoe market, the fake shoe market is also booming. In fact, you can buy a pair of shoes that looks just like an $1,100 pair of shoes. And when you order it, it will come in the same exact box as the real deal. You open it up, it's wrapped in the papers folded all origami style, not just thrown in there like, you know, at your local shoe spot. But you open up this package and every time you open something, there's a, a new layer of stickers and keychains and trinkets to to look just like the real deal. In fact, some of those shoes come with fake receipts. So it looks like you paid $400 or $800 for your pair of shoes. The Bible tells us that in the Old Testament, there was a system of sacrifices. And the author of Hebrews tells us that that system of sacrifices commanded by God was, was only looking toward something better and something greater. And the author of Hebrews starts off in chapters 9 and 10 by telling us that authenticity matters. And Jesus is greater than the other sacrifices in his authenticity. Chapter 9, verse 11. When Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through a greater and a more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands. That is to say, not a part of this creation. As you continue on, you see this in verse 24. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself. Now to appear for us in God's presence. The Old Testament sacrifices were simply representations of a sacrifice that would be made later that was more superior, greater than any of the old sacrifices that had ever been offered. Because the new sacrifice, the sacrifice that Jesus made after living his life perfectly without sin, went someplace that none of those sacrifices ever went. Those sacrifices were prepared by human hands. They were made in a human-built temple with stones and brick and mortar. But Jesus' sacrifice was different. The Bible tells us that Jesus' sacrifice was brought into a more perfect and holy tabernacle. It was brought into the very presence of God in heaven itself. And there it was offered on our behalf before God's face. His sacrifice is greater than all who had gone before because it wasn't just the upgrade. Of those sacrifices. It wasn't just the new version of those sacrifices. It always and only was the real, authentic, and only fully acceptable sacrifice before God Himself. They were all representatives looking forward to the ultimate sacrifice that would be made, the sacrifice that could perfectly do what they could not. The whole system was symbolic. In fact, if we look back at Hebrews chapter 8, talking about the high priests again, the author says they, the priests, served in a sanctuary that's a copy and a shadow of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle, see to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. You see, what Moses and the Israelites built was, was a sample, an, an example of 
of what God ultimately desires, and that's a sacrifice made in heaven, in his presence, that his people might enter into that same space and dwell, dwell with him forever. The ultimate sacrifice, the, the real, authentic sacrifice. But that's not all. Not only is Jesus' sacrifice more authentic than theirs, but the author of Hebrews tells us that he is greater than the sacrifices in the extent to which his sacrifice serves us. You see, the, the reach of his sacrifice goes beyond the, the extent or the, the scope of what his sacrifice accomplishes goes beyond what any of the other sacrifices was ever able to do. In Hebrews chapter 9 again, verses 9 and 10, we're told that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience, the conscience of the worshiper. You see, they were only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings. External regulations applying to the time of the new order. We're told here that, that those old sacrifices, they were superficial in, in what they were able to accomplish. And that Jesus' sacrifice would come all along and be more thorough than any of those ever were. And, and the phrase that's used that I think is helpful to us in this verse is they were various ceremonial washings. This idea of a ceremony is important. Because a ceremony doesn't actually do anything. If you stop and think about it. A ceremony only points to what has already done, been, been done. The graduation ceremony from kindergarten, from middle school, from high school, from college. The ceremony doesn't make you any smarter. You don't walk up on the platform and, and make your way across, grab your diploma, and as you go, pick up knowledge. Now it all makes sense. You're no smarter at the far end of the platform than you were at the beginning because the ceremony doesn't actually do anything. It just declares what has happened beforehand, the, the hard work, the years of study that you've put in, or the minutes of study that you've put in. It, 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 it speaks to the accomplishments of the work already done. Other ceremonies operate in the, the same way. Dedications are the same way. You don't do a building dedication to construct a, a new building. The, the dedication ceremony simply points at the work already done and indicates the effect, hopefully, that that work will have on those who enter into it. The ceremony doesn't change a community. The, the ceremony itself doesn't serve any purpose other than to, to declare what has happened. The blood of goats and bulls, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 13. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean, outwardly unclean, sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. You see, the old system, the old system made things superficially clean. Every couple weeks, I open our refrigerator, or Sarah opens our refrigerator, and we look in there and think, there is no room for another item in that place, right? We got styrofoam containers from the restaurant from like four or five days ago. Nope. Right? It's all shriveled and dried up. We got vegetables in the crisper tray that used to be kind of firm and now they're more mushy. But we've got half drank bottles of who knows what, soda, orange juice, whatever. I mean, we've got all this stuff that that nobody's going to drink. Nobody's going to eat. Nobody wants that stuff. And so we grab a trash bag and we bring it over to the refrigerator and we, you know, just start piling it in. Now all of a sudden we have room for something new, something better, something that would, would be healthy and beneficial for our family. We go through this cycle several times 
every, like I said, every couple weeks we just start dumping stuff. But after a couple months, inevitably, we start pulling things out of the fridge and we realize that, that the jello the kids made leaked onto the second shelf. That, that the cup of the, the soda from one of the local fast food restaurants, eventually the glue gave out because it was shoved to the back and somebody crushed it and it ran down the back of the fridge and now it's in our crisper tray. The cheese is now got stuff on it. We, we missed the soft cucumber and now it's a liquid cucumber. You see, just taking those things out isn't enough at that point, is it? You have to take everything out. You have to pull the trays out and take them to the sink and wash them with soap and water and make sure that we scrub the back and, and just get everything clean so that, that we can have peace knowing that it's been thoroughly cleansed. The Bible tells us that the old sacrificial systems made things outwardly clean. They, they made it room. They, they sufficed to make a relationship with God acceptable. But the author of Hebrews says Jesus does something much more thorough. The extent of his sacrifices reaches places that the old sacrifices couldn't reach. You see, Jesus' sacrifice cleanses us internally. His sacrifice actually changes ourselves, our, our full status with God himself. It changes the desires of our hearts. He changes the condition of our souls. He cleanses our consciences because, because he actually removes the guilt and the stain that it leaves. Those things that make us an abomination to God, he, he completely wipes away. In Hebrews chapter 10, we're told that the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it, again speaking of the law, it can never by the same sacrifices repeated, repeated endlessly year after year, it can never make perfect those who draw near to worship. It's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. They, they simply make you look right on the outside, but they, they can't fully remove sins, Hebrews 10 says. And then the author goes on. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties again and again. You could add again and again for, for hundreds of years. Again and again and again. He offers the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when this priest has offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Why did he sit down? It was sufficient. It was thorough. It was complete. It was finished. You see, Jesus' sacrifice ultimately cures and heals the brokenness that is left from our sin. He doesn't have to make sacrifice again and again like the Old Testament system. He is greater because he heals completely, because he forgives completely. Jesus is greater than all of the sacrifices that had ever been made because he went someplace they could never go. And he reached to places in our souls that they could never reach. One last thought. The author of Hebrews tells us that Jesus is greater than the sacrifices in terms of liability. Who's responsible to keep this thing intact and to, to hold it all together? Last week we talked a little bit about, uh, about covenant. We talked about the fact that when two individuals or, or two people groups came together and designated a, a representative for themselves, that those two representatives would, would enter into a ceremony of covenant 
that would make an agreement, a, a, a lasting binding arrangement between their two groups. That, that we will provide for each other when, when we have want or need. If you face great famine, we'll bring our resources to supplement and to help you, to, to care for you. We'll ex we exchange weapons to, to indicate that, that we'll protect one another. If someone comes against me, I can expect that you will show up to defend us and fight off the intruders. And I will show up on your behalf if someone comes to wage war against you as well. I talked about the fact that they would even go so far as to exchange firstborn sons. To seal the arrangement that, that I would never attack you or harm you or your people. I accept you as my own child. And in fact, my own child now lives in your home. And I will care for your people and love your people as if they are my own because yours now lives in my home. But the ceremony of covenant was, was finalized was sealed and arranged through a, a symbolic gesture. The two representatives or individuals would come together. They would dig a shallow grave. And then they would sacrifice an animal, typically a, a bull. They would cut the bull right down the middle. And they would lay one piece on each end of this shallow grave. And the two individuals would come together in the middle. They would stand together embrace one another and they would in essence declare may the may the same fate may i experience or suffer the same fate of this animal should i ever break our covenant if i ever come against you or fail to provide for you if I mistreat your people, if I love them poorly, if I sin against you, may I be destroyed like the animal that represents the covenant on either side of us. God invited Abraham and his descendants into that type of an arrangement. And we're told in the Bible that the night Abraham made covenant with God, he fell into a deep sleep, and he had a, a vision, and a, a, a darkness, and a dread came over him as, as Abraham saw this shallow grave and, and these, this animal that had been hewn in two. The arrangement was if Abraham ever broke the covenant, his people would suffer that fate. And the same for God, except he knew God would never fail in this arrangement. And then something mysterious happened. A, a smoking fire pot representing God himself moved between the severed pieces of this animal to represent that if either party ever broke covenant, God would represent and fulfill the required punishment for the broken sacrifice exactly what Jesus did. You see, God didn't break covenant, but we did and we have and we continue to do so. And Jesus is greater than the old sacrifices because he takes the liability of holding the agreement, the relationship together. Hebrews 9.15 For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the, under the first covenant. The sins that were committed were committed by God's people. They were not committed by God. And yet he stepped in and he took the punishment that was rightfully theirs to fully restore the relationship between them. He took on the liability. His sacrifice completely satisfies the terms of the broken covenant. We've already read that it, it only was required once because it was a perfect sacrifice, because it was authentic, because it reached 
into the, the deepest recesses of every human soul. It was far enough. It was sufficient. And in Hebrews chapter 10, we read phrases like this. In verse 10, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Verse 14, for by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. And verse 18, and where these things have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. It's been accomplished. The terms have been met. Jesus, by his sacrifice, removes the, the responsibility and the liability that you and I carry to hold the relationship together. Because he has died. For the times that you have broken covenant, for the times that I have broken covenant, he has died already once for all, for all of eternity. The author of Hebrews says it again and again. Not only for the sins that we have committed, but for the ones certainly that we will make in the future. He is greater than the sacrifices. Because he goes someplace that they never could. He covers that which they could not reach. And he carries the responsibility going forward. Wholly on his shoulders. That you and I might not break it again. We are not responsible to pay for the broken covenant. The payment's already been made. And now he holds this relationship together once and for all. He is greater than the sacrifices. He's greater than the priests who prepared and offered them. He's greater than the prophets who commanded them on God's behalf He's greater than the angels that will someday pour out God's wrath on those who have rejected the covenant and stand as enemies against a holy God. And he serves as a mediator who invites us into right, good, healthy, eternal relationship. He is greater than all things. Nothing pales in comparison to what he has accomplished on our behalf. And we worship him eternally for it. Let's pray. Jesus, we recognize your superior, superiority over all things. You truly are greater than all of creation. You are greater than all men. Lord, you are greater than even than the structures and the systems that have been put in place to maintain and hold together our right standing before God. You have completed it. You have secured it. And you hold it for all of eternity on our behalf. And Jesus, you alone deserve to be praised and worshipped and held high. You are greater than. You will be held above <coughs> all things. We pray this in your incredible name, your powerful name. Amen. The moon and stars
place how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me for i once was lost but now i'm found was blind but now i see hallelujah christ is risen from the grave hallelujah christ is risen from the grave Welcomed home the sinner now a saint But the God who died came back to life And everything has changed Hallelujah Christ is risen from the grave Hallelujah Christ is risen from the grave O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, fear, where is your power? mighty king of kings has disarmed you delivered and redeemed eternal life is ours who oh, praise his name forever alleluia christ is risen from the grave alleluia christ is risen from the grave and all throughout eternity our song will be the same hallelujah christ is risen from the grave and on the day you call me into heaven's sweet embrace I'll see your scars, your open arms, the beauty of your face. Through tears of joy, I'll lift my voice in everlasting praise. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, fear, where is your power? Mighty King of Kings has disarmed you, delivered and redeemed. Eternal life is ours. We praise His name forever. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. And all throughout eternity our song will be the same. Alleluia. Christ is risen from the grave. Oh, 